Hey friends, I'm Otis Gibbs, and this is my buddy Kenny Vaughn. He's going to share some stories about Les Paul. Oh, I, yeah, I saw him up, up in New York City one time. He uh, started at Fat Tuesdays, and then he moved over to a place called the Iridium, I think. I never saw him at the Iridium. I was going to go one night, and um, I'd been working all day in the studio. I was too tired because I had to go back and work all day the next day, and I was like, that ain't going. I wish I would have gone now, but I didn't. Did he still have his chops when you saw him? Yeah, the, I saw him Fat Tuesdays, and that was late 80s, early 90s. Yeah, he was, he was on fire, yeah. He still play really well. And, and I, oh, and I saw him at Nashville Now. I saw him then too. Uh, there used to be a show on TNN. It was a 90-minute music program, five days a week in the afternoon. Ralph Emery was the host. It was called Nashville Now, and they had country acts on, you know, for 90 minutes, interview on the couch and all that stuff. And, and a friend of mine, uh, the guy who started that band, Low Straight Jackets, was, uh, his name's Danny Amos, he was working there you know, on the floor. He was a, a floor director or something like that. And uh, he calls me up and he says, what are you doing? And I said, I don't know, hanging out. You know, it was one morning, he says, you better get down here because... Les Paul, um, Chad Atkins is the guest host, Ralph's not here, and Les Paul is his guest. I said, I'll be there. So I go down, he left my name at the back door, I'd played the show many times at that time, and um, I walked in the back door, and, and uh, Les Paul was, had rented a, a twin reverb from SIR Rentals, had that sent over, and he shows up with his guitar, and he plugs in, no effect or anything, you know, and he's playing, just burning, you know, playing really great stuff. And I'm standing there watching him. And he, and he says to the guy running the monitors, he said, listen, I need, um, a, you know, I can't remember what the millisecond was, you know, 80.1 millisecond <laughs> delay with two slapbacks and uh, on my microphone and coming through my monitor, you know. So mic my, 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 my amp and then put that through the delay and then give it back to me through my monitor. And that's, he got the echoplex sound, you know, the slapback sound. And he played for a second. He said, yeah, that's okay. A little bit less. Okay, perfect. And that was his sound check, you know. <laughs> and, uh, and, and less, I mean, Chet Atkins was playing one of these horrible solid body acoustic guitars that Gibson was making. He'd switched from Gretsch to Gibson guitars. And they were making like a, a nylon string solid body, a steel string solid body, and uh, two electrics, and four different models. Gibson was manufacturing for Chet. And uh, well, you know, they, he was, they put his name on it, you know. And, and I think there was an electric Stratocaster kind of thing too that they made. It was god awful. It was a to horrible. And um, he's, I had one of those uh, country gentlemen Gibsons, and it was terrible guitars. <laughs> horrible. I got it for free, but it was, it was it was terrible. But anyway, they're up there playing on the TV show, <laughs> and uh, you know they. Have you ever listened to those Chester and Lester records? Yes. You know they talk a lot while they're playing. You know. And, and uh, Lester's just burning, just killing it, you know. And, and Chad's playing this solid body electric steel string acoustic kind of thing. And, um, and Les says, well, you've been practicing while Chad's trying to play, you know. <laughs> you know, and it didn't sound really good, you know. It's like, why is he playing that guitar? You know, and, and, he, and he points to the headstock. He says, well, at least you finally got a decent guitar, you know. Because, you know, Gibson, you know. <laughs> 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 right you know, he was like, yeah, they're all buddies, so they're, I'm sure Chet knew he, what he was in for, but <laughs> less, less Paul heckling you while you're trying to play, you know. <laughs> it's great, though. It'll be bad enough. You know. Man, he was good that day. Whoa. He was on fire. There's a story about him. On the, you know, he lived down, down in New Jersey, and um, maybe he's always going up to New York City for, for whatever reason. You know, he's coming home on the New Jersey New Jersey Turnpike one night late, and he's speeding. He gets pulled over by a cop, 
And um, he rolls down his window and he says, you know, he's talking to the officer and he says, hey, do you play guitar? And uh, the guy says, yeah, I do. He says, I'll bet my name's on your guitar. And he goes and opens the trunk and says, is it this kind? He you know, has a Les Paul model in the, with his name up on the, you know, it's up on that uh, you know, headstock. It's a Les Paul model, you know. And the guy apparently did. And he's like, let him go. Now, I don't know if that's a true story or not. But <laughs> he always told that story, so I don't know if it's true. Man, I had to sell, I had a 55 Les Paul with two P90s that I acquired, and it was my favorite guitar I ever had, but I had to sell it because I needed money. It was so sad. How much did you get it for? I think I paid um, probably around, I traded into it. So I probably had about 4,500 bucks roughly into it, and I sold it for seven grand, so, you know. What would it be worth now? I don't know, it was, it, what was the deal with that guitar? The, the, uh, the wiring harness had been robbed out of it and replaced with modern wiring. So that devalued it quite a bit. That was the, that's why I was able to own it, because the wiring harness was gone. Because those things are worth a lot of money. Just the, the, the four, you know, potentiometers, the switch and the wire. Just that is worth a lot. And um, somebody more of it and replaced it with modern stuff. But it still sounded good because the pickups were still the same pickups. So the original pickups. I got it from Grin, so he knew. And he gave me a good deal. You know, Gibson guitars, the Gibson electric gu guitars from 1948 to 1969 really are infallible. They're, you know, they're just... They were so well made, and they used really good wood that had been sitting there aging for years. You know, they had a big, big ass supply of wood that was in the warehouse drying out. And back in those days, it was easier to get old wood. Just the, the trees were old, and then they would age them for, you know, they, some of that wood apparently had been sitting in the Gibson drying, you know, wherever they kept the lumber for 30 years, you know. And when the guitar boom happened, they went, they, they kind of used it all up. So by the late 60s, they started using greener wood. And that was a problem. And the guys who were doing the fret work from, you know, the 30s to the end of the 60s were the best. I mean, the best frets ever. They're, they're, they're next for the best. Gibson guitars are the best, you know. They're, they're, if you're a jazz player, what are you going to play? You know? You're going to play a Gibson, man. Arch top or whatever, you know? But that's, that was the thing. And I don't know why, why they're so good. They just were, really were. Um, I remember uh, when we were recording at Mike Campbell's studio, and um, he has a 59 Les Paul, you know, the Holy Grail. And... I had my amp there, and he went and got it, and plugs it into my amp and hands it to me. And, uh, and he says, "Turn up and play it." And I was like, "Oh wow, <laughs> you know, that sound is like you can't get that sound anywhere else. It's like a new Les Paul, built exactly the same way. I mean, scientifically, they can get really close, but they can't get that certain extra little something. There's this thing. It's like this thick sort of." unbelievably rich sound that comes out of those things those like the 58 and the 59 those two years are like crazy good man I don't know why in the 57 some of them sound really good and I've I've talked to people that say they played 59s that didn't sound good and I believe that you know but everyone I played was amazing it's something extra there man is the reason that everybody plays guitar you know, I mean, Jeff Beck, where do you get his sound? Les Paul and Bo Diddley. Th 
those were his two biggest influences, you know. Mm -hmm. So you got Bo Diddley's mumbling guitar, mm -hmm. you know. That's Jeff Beck. That's that's you know like he he did that on uh, the end of um, uh, their version of the studio version of I'm a Man off of having a rave up with the Yardbirds at the end of the song where he goes and just like muted the strings and just just sounded like a locomotive. That's a Bo Diddley thing, you know, mumbling guitar. And uh, when he, even when he was in the Tridents, um, he was doing the Bo Diddley thing, making noises and barnyard noises and all that kind of stuff on the guitar. And uh, But his other thing was Les Paul, you know. He sounded exactly like Les Paul on, on Beck's Boogie, Jeff's Boogie, I think it's called. You know, that's Les Paul. That's what he, everything on that cut is Les Paul. That's what he was doing, you know. You know, Les Paul was a Django Reinhardt fan, obviously. He, was, he got a lot from that. You know, he was kind of took that and ran with it. But, you know, he was working with George Barnes in Chicago who was a fabulous jazz guitar player. They had a duo. And I'm, I'm sure he, George must have been influenced him a lot as well. But man, that guy was a genius. One of the first guys to try to figure out how to make a better way of amplifying the guitar. Gibson had its uh, ES-150 that Charlie Christian played. Charlie was a big influence on Les. He, was, he influenced everybody, you know. Between Django Reinhardt and Charlie Christian, that was pretty much all Les needed to hear. You know, he kind of combined those two and became Les Paul. But his, you know, his, he was never happy with the electric, the hollow body electric guitars. You know, once you got to a certain volume, it became problematic, and he didn't want to have to deal with that. So he was always messing around with pickups and solid bodies and stuff and. When Gibson approached him, he was glad, and he gave them a way less input than people think they did. You know, he took he took credit where that should have gone to Ted McCarty, the head of Gibson, because he only had a few demands that, and they like having the pickups as deep into the body as he could get it was one of his first things, and uh, the first year or two, the first two years of the Les Paul that was built like that, but then they changed the design to get rid of the trapeze bridge, and uh, that's when they sort of moved away from that, having to pick up so deep in the body, because they had to raise them up a little bit to get a better break over the bridge, and change the neck angle of the guitar, the way, the way the neck was glued into the body at a, different, a steeper angle. So. You can get more height over the over the bridge was higher, and um, that kind of fixed the problem. But really, he took credit for that guitar more than he deserved. Really, his name's on it. But he was very dissatisfied with the pickups always, and he made his own pickups and put him. What Gibson would do, they'd send him guitars with no pickups, and he'd rat them out and to fit his whatever design he'd been working on. And he wound up using low impedance pickups because he wanted a cleaner sound. He wanted to be able to plug right into his Ampex tape deck direct without using an amp or a mic or anything. And uh, nobody else was doing anything like that. Nobody really, those pickups never caught on. Les Paul used those from the, in the even in the 50s, he was using those things. And that Gibson put out this Les Paul recording and a Les Paul professional model that went nowhere uh, because they were low impedance pickups and you couldn't get them to sound like a rock and roll record, you know, like a Les Paul that everybody else played with the humbuckers, you know. Was that an XLR? Yeah. Track, yeah, I do believe one of the models did, yeah. But he'd moved, that was his thing, you know, he wanted that clean crystal zingy sound and um, but man, those records he made with his wife where it's just him and his wife. And it's like, you know, 15 guitars. Yeah, I was at the Library of Congress and um, they let us go in the, down in the, it's not the one in DC, but at the, the, the secret place where they keep all the stuff. 
it's a, it's underground and you have to go through security and all this stuff but this guy took us down there with marty stewart and we went into the i mean there's so much stuff there i mean they have every movie ever made you know you can't go in those rooms because they, they, those guys are wearing like space suits and everything you know like the climate control and they're keeping the dirt out and all that stuff it's to preserve the film you know and um but there was this guy who had a, a pro tools rig and he had he had been in the process of transferring every les paul you know those early recordings were made before the tape so they were you know uh, i guess a lathe so he had two of them so he could bounce from one to the other back and forth you know and he would you know start off and he so the guy had gone through and they had all these stacks of like these discs you know that he'd cut and just for one song would have like you know 25 you know of discs and he had put them all in dumped them all into pro tools for each song and he would you know well here's the drum sound it's this less make it a drum sound on his guitar you know and then here's the bass sound it's just less playing a like a bass you know part on the guitar and it's all these different sounds in the guitar and then all the vocal tracks of his wife all those harmonies you know background harmonies and you know it's probably 10 of her and 15 20 guitars you know whatever and we sat there and listened to a couple of you know he just went different tri you know tracks it was like fascinating like wow what a genius it was like 51 52 that that, that, that little they were the biggest thing on the planet They're, those records they just kept you know hitting the charts every two or three months with a new single and it's like it, they were really big and they were making a lot of money and he was so cheap he had his like he carried his big ampex deck in the back of the trunk and he had a little fender amp he has a guitar their suitcases they get one hotel room and they cart the the Ampex up to the hotel room and set it up, you know, and he'd work. He was a workaholic. He'd spend days without sleeping, you know, just he'd work in the hotel room. There's pictures of him working in the kitchen at home, you know, like when she's got a microphone over the sink <laughs> and she's standing there washing dishes, you know, there's this microphone hanging down, you know, I was like, wow, you know, that was after, I think they did that when they had tape, yeah, but, um, what a guy. But when he was doing those lathe recordings, he had to plan the first track to the last track, what was going to be loudest and what was going to be, you know, had to figure all that stuff out, trial and error and, you know, untold hours. And then when he came up with the idea for the multi-track thing on his Ampex machine, he had the Ampex tape machine, he kept tinkering with it. He's like, oh, this is going to be easy. So he goes, has lunch with the guy at Ampex and had a, a paper napkin and a pen and he drew how he wanted the heads made on a piece, on a napkin. Here, do that for me. I need this. And that was the first multi-track machine. And when he started doing that, um, you know, all these guys call him, Bing Crosby was one of his clients who would come over and make records so he could sing harmony with himself. You know, and uh, one of those other singers, I think he had her over, Patty Page, one of those kind of people. I don't remember which one it was, K-Star, Patty, Patty Page, somebody like that, made a record where they sang harmony with themselves, which is a novelty.